I had the privilege this morning of speaking to Ralph Ellis. If you've heard of Ralph Ellis before, you'll know his contrarian views uh, are, are quite out there. In comparison to normal academia, he does rattle quite a few cages. Uh, if you haven't heard of him before, well, be prepared for your mind to be blown because the things that this guy says and studies and, and has researched over the last 30 years has been absolutely outstanding, uh, astounding work. So it was an absolute pleasure to, to have him on. Uh, I first saw him three or four years ago on the Unslaved podcast talking about this uh, alternative history. Uh, the one thing that Ralph Ellis does, it, it removes myth from the religious scripture and he it puts in actual historic record. So if you want to find out who Ralph thinks the, the, the real Jesus Christ was and Mary Magdalene and uh, Moses and things like that, if you're into the scriptures, he talks about that in this, in this podcast episode. The reason that I had Ralph on is because history, human beings history, is one of the most important topics for authentic personal development. It's very often overlooked because it isn't instantly gratifying. If you don't know where you've come from, how do you know where you are now? If you don't understand our ancestry and our ancestral traumas, how can we understand the divisions in our own psychology right now? So this is the, one of the reasons that I had Ralph Ellis on. I usually spend about an hour with podcast guests, but Ralph and I were talking for over two hours, Ralph mainly talking, because uh, he was just absolutely blowing my mind with some of the stuff that he was saying. So it's a long one. Uh, if you could like, subscribe, ring the bell and all that other good stuff on YouTube, if you could subscribe to Apple or Spotify or any of the other platforms that you use, I really do appreciate it. The channel now is sort of morphing itself into a personal development, more of an, an integrous, authentic personal development channel. Something I think is dearly missing in the industry at the moment. So that that is where the channel is, is going right now. And uh, Ralph is an important part. His work is incredible and we, we need to be studying this thing. Thank you for listening wherever you are. Please subscribe, like, share, do all that other good stuff. Enjoy. Ralph, thank you for joining me for the conversation. It's an absolute privilege. Pleasure, Alex. Good to be on your show. Uh, the thing I love about your work, uh, Ralph, is that it's very contrarian to the majority of things that I've read elsewhere, even on YouTube or anything. In particular, you sort of bring mythology and ancient scripture and you, you sort of bring that into actual historical record. How do you, um, what has happened in your life that led you down the path of studying history and, and to be such a contrarian historian? Well, I've, uh, I suppose I've always been a truth seeker and a contrarian, even from, um, you know, from infant school. Uh, I was always the um, kid at the back of the class who, with the hand up, saying, well, actually, what you're saying is not actually what it says, you know. Mm. Uh, I don't agree, you know. Where's your evidence? Where's your proof? Um, and, that, of course, that was especially true in, in theology, um, which has very little proof, very uh little history in it okay. and um from there i built on that as time went on so i wrote the first chapter uh, in my first uh, what was it first or second second book uh, jesus last of the pharaohs i wrote the first chapter when i was 14 um just because i didn't believe what i was being told and uh, the trouble was as a contrarian as a, uh, I'm not sure if I was an atheist at that point, I was probably a Gnostic, uh, uh, agnostic. Um, people would say, well, why are you? Why are you different? And of course, in those days, uh, as a youngster, um, being a, an agnostic was actually a little bit unusual, I would say. Most people in my school were probably um, uh, not committed Christians, but they were Christian. And they would ask, why? Why are you different? Why, why don't you believe this? And of course, to answer that question, I had to look at the texts. And the more I looked at the texts, the more agnostic I became. Because they did not agree with what we were being told in class. 
and they did not agree with history as I knew it, even as a, a youngster. Um, and I've, I've built on that ever since um, because I found so many holes in the story. Mm. And uh, that, that particular chapter, well, it took, I don't know, it took um, 15 years before it actually um, went into print, but it finally went into print in Jesus Last of the Pharaohs, which was my first investigation into the biblical texts. Um, because there is a problem with the biblical text. Uh, a, it's not taught very well, but B, the story is not there in the historical record. So we have this ancient text, a complete text, a vast text, a text that if it had been found today, you know, in a pot in Egypt somewhere and someone had dug up this, this manuscript, people will be pouring all over it, looking for real history within this manuscript. But of course we have that manuscript and there is no real history in it. All those people are missing from the historical record, you know, all the way from the very beginning, from Adam and Eve and um, Abraham and Jacob and Jesus and Saul and everyone else. They're all missing from the historical record. How can that be? And so my Jesus last of the Pharaohs uh, took the obvious route and, and placed this story back into Egypt because the first thing I saw, I don't know which bits of the um, Bible you want to dig in first, but the first thing I saw was that the uh, biblical Exodus, which is not there in the historical record, everybody says that, you know, every textbook you look at will say that the uh, biblical Exodus cannot be found in the historical record mm. but i found it in one afternoon of looking and you've got to ask yourself well how is that possible how have all these people missed the obvious connection because the the obvious solution is that the biblical exodus is the hyksos exodus because the shepherd kings the exodus of the shepherd kings and of course the biblical patriarchs were called shepherds that's why they were called shepherds because they were the shepherd kings um and on further investigation it just happened that the hyksos exodus is exactly the same as the biblical exodus except in one aspect the date it's like 400 years earlier uh, 300 years earlier? Yeah, maybe 300 years earlier. Anyway, um, it's about 1570 BC as against uh, 1320, I suppose, BC. Um, so apart from that, they are identical. Now, for, for whatever reason, Orthodox, Orthodox theologians and Orthodox historians, which I find very strange, will not accept that difference in date. Why, why do you think that is? I don't, I, I think because it changes the story too much. I mean, you can imagine theologians um, don't want their story being changed. They've only got one story to pedal. Mm -hmm. They've peddled the same story for, you know, 2000 years or more. And it's very difficult if someone comes along and changes that story. Because changing the date does change the story a little bit. Um, because it implies that the biblical patriarchs were pharaohs of Egypt. And so you can see that changes the story. Yeah, yeah. So However, let, if they oh. looked into history, if you mm. look into the history of Josephus Flavius, who wrote uh, his um, Antiquities of the Jews, which is a, it's an Old Testament, basically. It's exactly the same as the Old Testament, but written from a secular uh, standpoint. So it's a real history, supposedly, of the uh, Israelites and the Jews. And it, it reads as a secular manuscript rather than a um, biblical manuscript. But he goes through the same story because it's the story of the same people. And he records the Exodus event, of course. And then later on in his um, Against Appion, which he wrote much later, probably about 10 years later, um, he wrote that the Hyksos were our people. So here is the greatest historian of Judaism 
admitting and saying that the Hyksos pharaohs of Egypt were our people. And what does that mean? That the Israelites were pharaohs of Egypt. They were the Hyksos. And that sort of changes the story. I mean, he doesn't make much of it. Um, he's, he's trying to marry up the history of Manetho, the Egyptian historian from about third century BC. He's trying to marry that history up to biblical history. And as a part of that, he says that the Israelites were the Hyksos pharaohs of Egypt and therefore the Hyksos exodus out of Egypt was the Israelite exodus out of Egypt. And that's so obvious. A again, we come back to, you know, why, why would people not um, admit that? But if you look at the two, um, let's see if I can remember offhand. Uh, you've got a group of people in Egypt. This is from real history. This is not from the Bible. So you have a group of people in Egypt uh, who are called shepherds. Um, one of their kings is called Jacob or Jacob. Um, they're involved in a war with the uh, southern Egyptians. There is darkness for three days. There is uh, hail and thunder. Well, actually, it was, uh, uh, it was more dust. Oh, yes, that's part of the exodus anyway. So there was a, a dust fall. Uh, remember, Moses says, uh, God said to him, take ashes from the hearth of the fire and throw them up into the air and they will become a small dust over the whole land of Egypt. Right, okay, well that actually happened in 1580, 1590 BC. It was called the Thera eruption. Um, so there was darkness for three days, there was an ash fall, there was a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke, and of course there was a great tsunami remember the waters parting and uh, the Egyptian army getting caught in the waters as they came back. That was a tsunami in the, um, uh, the Reed Sea, which is uh, against the Mediterranean coast. If you read all of that, oh, and of course that resulted in an exodus. There was a, a civil war between the southern Egyptians and the northern Egyptians yes. and 500,000 uh, of these Hyksos shepherd kings, the Hyksos, uh, were thrown out of Egypt and they went from Pi Ramesse and they went to Jerusalem. Now, again, this is real history. Um, sound sim uh, familiar? Yeah, it does sound familiar because it's the same story. Um, and because of that, we can now explain the whole of the Exodus event. And I don't think I'm the first to say this, but I'm sort of the first to actually look at the ramifications of this. Um, the exodus was caused by the eruption of Thera, Santorini. In yes, the, modern day Santorini, yeah. Yeah, the, that was the biggest uh, volcanic eruption in recorded history. Uh, it happened in about 1600 BC when the island of um, Thera or Santorini, uh, up towards, um, well, it's just sort of north of Crete, really, um, exploded. <clears throat> And it caused a pillar of fire, a pillar of smoke. It caused uh, an ash fall across the whole of the Eastern Mediterranean. And of course, it did cause a huge great tsunami, which caught out the Egyptian army, um, according to the biblical text. And you have to take this as being the truth. And OK, it's difficult to accept a, a truth from a book that's, you know, 3,500 years old. However, the circumstances indicate that this must be the truth because these are what you might call um, black swan events. Mm -hmm. So the black swan event for people who don't know is something that's so unusual, so incredible that you could never actually predict it happening. And the term comes from the sailors when they went to Perth in Australia and they came across the black swans. Yeah. Now, who in the European sort of environment would ever imagine you can have a swan which is completely black? But there they are. So it's a very unexpected event. Well, in this biblical story, we have three or four 
black swans, all in the same story. So we have the pillar of fire and the pillar of smoke. Um, we have the three days of darkness. We have the ash fall. What causes ash fall all across Egypt? And we have the tsunami. So here are four or more inexplicable events all linked together in the same story. And you have to ask, how would any chronicler in that era know that a, um, a volcanic event would cause a pillar of fire and smoke, uh, darkness for three days, an ashfall and a tsunami, if that was not a eyewitness event? It's just got to be an eyewitness event. And then we have real history. So, you know, this Old Testament story, which all seems a bit mythological, it seems a bit um, strange, disconnected with uh, real history. Suddenly it becomes real history. And more than that, it's datable history because we know when the Santorini eruption happened. You know, we're, we're homing in on the Santorini eruption to plus or minus 20 years. It's somewhere around 1600 BC. So now you can place this biblical story back into Egypt and back into real history with a very secure timeline. And what history would that be? Would that be the 18th Egyptian? Uh, it's, yeah, it's just the beginning of the 18th dynasty. So um, it actually started the 18th dynasty. Right, so okay. the Pharaoh concerned was... Uh, Carmosi and Achmosis, and they were the, let me think about this, the last, they were either the last um, pharaohs of the 17th dynasty or the, the first pharaohs of the 18th. I think they were the last of the 17th dynasty. So we can put this story back into history. And the interesting thing, and I write about this in my book, Tempest and Exodus, is that the Egyptians write the same story. And I go through this in the book, um, chapter by chapter. So we, we have this Exodus story, which has all of these details in it. And then we have from the Egyptian side, we have the Tempest Stella, which tells the same story of the eruption of Thera, because we know it happened uh, at about the time of Armosi I, and the Tempest Stella is a stellar of Armosi the first. Um, and it has the same details as the biblical story. So it has the, de the details of this civil war between the northern Egyptians, the Hyksos, and the southern Egyptians. And it, it says that the Hyksos were bought off, which is more or less what it says in the biblical story. So they were given um, gold and silver and cloth and oil in order to leave Egypt and also to make the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant. Those materials for those items were given to them by the southern Egyptians um, in order for them to leave Egypt. And yet we have this story from the... Uh, from the Torah, and we have the same story from the uh, Tempest Stella of Amosi the first. And if you look at it closely, it is the same story. Uh, I did wonder at one point if, if uh, one was copying from the other, but on reading the two texts, I think it's two independ independent eyewitness accounts of the same event, of the same history, written from their Yes, own sure. individual perspective, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is real history now. So we, we just reset the Torah back into real Egyptian history. And the problem, we, you know, we were looking at the problem, why don't people admit this, is that it means that the Hyksos were Egyptians, mm -hmm. that they were polytheists, because the Hyksos were okay, they were supposed to be Semites from Mesopotamia, very much the same as, as the biblical patriarchs, of course, 
but they had become highly Egyptianized. Yeah. So they spoke Egyptian. They um, they had an Egyptian sort of culture. They worshipped most of the Egyptian gods mm. um, with a slightly different bias. But, you know, they were essentially, you could class them as being Egyptians. So where did we where did we move into monotheism from that point then? Was that um, from Akhenaten? Akhenaten, yeah. So these were the Hyksos people. They were thrown out of Egypt on this great exodus, which is recorded as we've seen in the um, Torah and in real history. But then we have the story in the Torah of them coming back into Egypt. The story of Joseph. Uh, coming back down into Egypt and rising very, um, very strangely, rising to become the prime minister of Egypt. He became the vizier, the prime minister of Egypt and the richest person in the whole of Egypt. And I have to go along with um, uh, Ahmed Osman on this. Many years ago, he wrote Stranger... Uh, yeah, Stranger in the Valley of the Kings, <clears throat> which was his idea, and I think it's true, that the Joseph character was Yuya. And Yuya was the patriarch of the uh, Amarna dynasty, the dynasty of Pharaoh Akhenaten. So he, was the he wasn't a king, he was just a, an aristocrat. But Yuya had one of the largest and most expensive uh, tombs in the whole of Egypt. And, and it was all recovered intact. You know, it's all in the um, Egyptian museum, in the Cairo Museum. Um, Yuya was a very, very wealthy character and Ahmed Osman linked him up, I think, um, very well. So almost like 95% Yuya has to be Joseph. It's got to be the same person. Uh, and so now we have this, this history of this uh, Hyksos exiles coming back into Egypt. And the funny thing is, of course, it's, it's something I, I tackle in my books quite a lot. Uh, Yuya was ginger. Right. He was ginger head, uh, as was Ramesses II. You know, all of, all of this Ramesside uh, Akhenaten dynasty were all ginger haired. And that has ramifications when we come onto the New Testament, which we might talk about later. Mm -hmm. um, so we have these Hyksos coming back into Egypt after their exile. And they started the Amarna dynasty through Amenhotep III, and then going down to Amenhotep IV, who is Pharaoh Akhenaten and Nefertiti, and them setting up their new cult center because essentially it was they were banished from Egypt and set up a new city in the center of Egypt which was a religious cult center in more or less the same as sort of David Koresh uh, mm -hmm. down in um, Texas wasn't it I forget where he was now mm -hmm. um, more or less the same sort of thing because he was banished um, by Amenhotep the third his father so he set up his own um, capital city down in the, the uh, center of uh, Egypt. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> and then he became uh, the next pharaoh when his father died. And uh, that was the beginning of the Amarna dynasty. And of course, Akhenaten was the first monotheist. And many people have linked Akhenaten with the monotheism of the Israelites. Um, including people like Sigmund Freud, who pointed this out in one of his books, um, that it is a very similar sort of philosophy. And that's where the, um, excuse me, <clears throat> that's where the um, monotheism was of the Israelites came from. But I can go much further than that because I can tell you why he set it up. Uh, because the, the whole problem, the whole problem with the Exodus, um, excuse me again, okay. <clears throat> the whole problem with the Exodus 
uh, was a change in the heavens above. Ah, okay. So uh, this is where one of the many regions where the information we're given, our education, whether you're in uh, church uh, or whether you're in school, the education we are given is very defective. And this is why I started my journey, because I saw these many um, lacunas, you might call it, these gaps in our education that they're not telling us the full truth, yeah. only half the truth. And one of the big things they leave out, both on the historical side and on the theological side, is that the primary symbol of early Judaism, right up until the first, second and third century AD, um, in Judea, their primary symbol was the zodiac. Mm. And people looking at Judaism or Christianity, they won't believe that. But if you go around any of the, um, uh, the uh, temples in, in um, temples in, in uh, Judea and uh, Syria and Jordan, um, the primary symbol on the floor of these uh, uh, meeting houses was the zodiac. And the best of these is the one at um, uh, Hamat Tavira on the Sea of Galilee, uh, which was, a, was owned by a guy called Jesus, and we can come on to that later. <laughs> and it's a wonderful zodiac, and it's also a processional zodiac. Yeah. So it's quite large, you know, it's probably about five meters across or something on the, uh, on the floor in a mosaic. And it's a processional zodiac detailing the procession of the equinox. But if we go back to uh, the Egyptian era, there was a change in the heavens above. So um, uh, let me have a think. Taurus changed to Aries, Aries in about yeah. 1750 BC. So it's gone from the bull to the sheep. From the, the bull to the sheep. So we mm. went from Apis bull worship to the shepherd kings. This is why we mm. had this dispute with the shepherd kings, because they were venerating the um, great month of uh, Aries. I call these great months because <clears throat> they're exactly the same as an annual month, but each month takes 2,200 years. So it's a very great month, it's a very long month, uh, but the constellations do change exactly as they do in an annual year. And in 1750 BC, they changed from Taurus to Aries, and that's why we had the Shepherd Kings, and that is why we had this big dispute, uh, as it's recorded in the, um, uh, in the Torah, between the Shepherd Pharaohs, the Shepherd Patriarchs of the Bible, and the bull worshippers, you know, hence the um, uh, construction of the golden calf and all of that business and yes, Moses yes. destroying the golden calf. That was all a part of this dispute over the um, constellations in the heavens above. Um, and this is highlighted again in the Torah when um, Joseph comes back down into Egypt. And there's a perfect ex explanation here of what, what goes on. Um, but again, Nobody will see the truth because they don't want to see the truth. So Joseph comes down into Egypt and then he, uh, he becomes uh, the prime minister of Egypt. He becomes very wealthy, becomes very powerful. And he invites his family down into Egypt to join him. And he says to them, you will meet Pharaoh. Whatever you do, don't say you are shepherds. Say that you are cattle breeders from your youth until now. Otherwise, you will not be allowed to stay in the lands of Egypt. And what does that mean? You know, the, it, it's, it's given and interpreted in agricultural terms. Yes. But there was never any um, prohibition on eating sheep or anything of that nature within Egypt. It makes no sense in agricultural terms, even though theologians and historians will um, 
interpret it in that fashion. So what was it talking about? It was talking about the heavens, of course. It was talking about Taurus and Aries. So um, what he was saying is, you will, uh, so this is Joseph talking to his brothers, you will meet Pharaoh. When you meet Pharaoh, don't tell him you are Hyksos shepherd kings, exiled. Um, say that you are Apis bull worshippers, otherwise you will not be allowed to stay in the lands of Egypt. Um, so we were talking about the heavens again. We were talking about the great month of Taurus changing into the great month of Aries. And this was the contention that had caused the exodus. And he didn't want to cause another civil war within Egypt and get his people thrown out of Egypt once again. Uh, but the brothers were not um, very diplomatic and they said they were actually shepherds uh, and they were allowed to stay. Now, what I think happened is, is that contention. So this would have been circa, uh, I don't know, circa sort of 1400 BC or something, maybe when they came back into Egypt, we don't exactly know. If it was Yulia, we're talking about um, 1380s BC, if Joseph was Yulia. Um, so they are in Egypt for 60 years. Akhenaten gains power, he becomes the pharaoh, and he decides that the way to get rid of this contention between the bulls and the sheep, between Taurus and Aries, is to do away with the images of the gods. So if he says there is only one God, don't worry about all of these images of sheep or bulls. Um, there is only one God who is a manifestation of the sun above, then that contention should go away and hopefully there will be peace between his people and the southern Egyptians down in Thebes. And I think that was his intention. So, um, and it was probably a, a very sensible contention to bring peace to the fractious lands of Egypt. Didn't quite work, though, because the people didn't like their gods being destroyed. So uh, Akhenaten must have been in a position of power because he would have to send his army because nobody could do it on their own. He must have sent his army into every temple in southern Egypt to destroy their images of their gods in their temples. Now, you would need quite a lot of power in order to do that. And of course that created resentment. He closed down all of their temples and instituted new temples with his own image um, and the image of the Aten, his, his God. Um, which is why his experiment eventually ended because there was too much contention um, against him. But we sort of know this is something to do with the biblical story because the god of Akhenaten was called the Aten or the Adon. It's spelt with a T or a D. Mm -hmm. And the god of the Israelites is called Yahweh, El, Elohim, Shaddai, or the Adon. It has the same name as the god of Akhenaten. And that's one of the many reasons we can be sure that uh, the monotheism of the Israelites came from Pharaoh Akhenaten. Mm. And Atom sounds very much like Adam, uh, which could lead us down the, the path of Genesis in the Garden of Eden. Yes, it could, could well do. It was, um, both of them were actually pronounced more like Eton. Right. Um, so, yes, it sounds like Eden, yeah, mm. because the Aten god is spelt with a, with a, uh, a reed glyph, and the reed glyph is more of an E than an A. Mm. So instead of being the Aten, it's the Eton, which with a D, which is how it was spelt in Egypt as well, 
would become the Eden and the Garden of Eden. So, uh, yes, you're right. Every, um, every god, and um, certainly Akhenaten had one, um, every god would have a, god, um, a garden of the god, a garden of the Aten, a garden of Eden. Mm. Um, and there was a garden just like that in Amarna, the capital city of Pharaoh Akhenaten. There was a garden of the uh, Eton god. Uh, and in addition to that, Egypt itself was probably a garden as well, because you have this strip oasis that runs through the desert, and then it becomes the Nile Delta, um, which is a, a garden of the god Eton. It, it again is the garden of Eton. And we know that this is what they were talking about, because if you go back into Genesis, um, in the first chapter, I think, of Genesis uh, one twelve, I forget, I'll have to look it up. It says that a river flowed through the garden. And from thence, it was divided and became four branches or heads. Now, there is only one river that does that in this region that runs through a garden and then is parted to become four branches, and that is the Nile. Mm. So we're not talking about the Euphrates and the Tigris here. They don't divide in that same fashion. The only river that runs through a garden and divides into four branches is the Nile. And of course, it was ruled by a king who was called Akhenaten, and he had a garden for the god Eton. It was the Garden of Eton, the Garden of Eden. Um, so, yeah, it, it sort of all begins to fit together. Mm. So I sort of, uh, I often liken this to a sort of jigsaw puzzle, um, where you have all these individual pieces and you don't exactly know where they fit. Well, if your theory is incorrect, then these pieces will just not fit together. But if your theory is correct, then all of the individual pieces will slot in together very nicely. And of course, all of these pieces do slot in very, very nicely. You know, you find something like the Garden of Eton and it matches the history perfectly of Pharaoh Akhenaten. If you realize that Pharaoh Akhenaten was something to do with this um, Exodus story, and he was. Uh, because they've duplicated. What, what's happened is there were two exoduses. So in, in real history, there was uh, the exodus, the great exodus we've already been through. Um, and then there was a small exodus. And the small exodus, we have this from the Egyptian uh, historian Manitho, who gives the history of these exoduses. And the small exodus was the exodus of Pharaoh Akhenaten because there is no evidence that he actually died in Egypt. And so it's highly likely that him and Nefertiti and Kia actually went on an exodus and left Middle Egypt and went elsewhere. And if you read Manetho, it says that they initially went to, um, uh, to Avaris, which was the old capital of the Hyksos, um, and then they went elsewhere from there. But of course, remember, Avaris, which is where the great exodus started, the exodus of the Hyksos people, Avaris is called Pyramusi. It's the same city. The one was built upon the other. Right. So the Bible was correct when it said the exodus left from Pyramusi because Pyramusi is exodus, is, is, um, is uh, Avaris. Wow. So how do you get on with Christians, Ralph? Because I bet you go down and look a cup of cold sick with the average Christian, don't you? Um, yes. Um, it depends how open-minded they are. If you have a, a discussion with a um, Church of England uh, vicar, they're fairly happy with it because they're not 
quite so wedded to the literal word of the Bible that they can't accept something that's slightly out, outside the normal. If you talk to a Catholic, of course, then you're persona non grata um, because they hang on every word of the uh, Torah and the, um, and the Gospels. Mm. Um, because as I say to them, if they are open-minded at all, I'm not changing anything. In fact, what I'm doing is I'm saying that your book is correct. You have this ancient book from history, which has no connection with reality. It could be written on Mars because nobody can find anything in it in the historical record. You claim it is true, but you have no evidence that it is true. And I've just proved that it's true. So you should be celebrating. Mm. But they can't celebrate because I've changed the story slightly. Suddenly, these are not poor shepherds, which is always the common excuse. Yeah. Oh, they're just Bedouins, you know, in the desert, you know. They were the slaves of the evil Egyptians. No. The real story, which is the same story, is they were shepherd kings. They were pharaohs of Egypt, and they dominated Egypt. They were the um, oppressing power. They love to play this underdog role. In fact, many people do it. Uh, Muslims will do it today. Oh, we're the oppressed. Yeah. Because it works very well. It, it works um, as a method of keeping a people together. You know, we're the oppressed. Those horrible oppressors, they're all against us. So we've got to stay together as a group. So it works very well for the uh, Israelites, uh, staying together as a cohesive group. And it's uh, a very good weapon to um, wield against your enemies. You're the oppressor, you're the terrible people. The Egyptians were evil. Yeah, but you were Egyptians yourself and you were pharaohs of Egypt who controlled 90% of Egypt at one point mm. until you had that um, civil war with the uh, Theban Egyptians. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, Rob, let me ask, would you consider Akhenaten then the founder of what we would know today as, as Christianity? In some senses, yes. Um, because he started the monotheism, which, which translated itself into Christianity. Um, he also, all of the pharaohs were sons of God. So Ramesses means the son of Ra. Um, Tuthmoses is the son of Thoth. They were all sons of a god or another. Mm. Akhenaten portrayed himself in a slightly different role um, in that he was the messenger of God. So now he's the sort of like the, the Muhammad of the um, 14th century BC. He's now the messenger of God. And if you want favors from the God, you have to go through him in order to get your blessings and your favors. And that's where he derives his power from as the monarch of all Egypt, because Nobody can pray directly to the God. They have to go through him as being their savior. So that sort of gave him a very powerful position. And of course, you can see how that translated into Christianity later with the Jesus character taking on the same role, um, not only as the son of God, but as the messenger um, through which you can uh, have dialogue with the God above. Mm. So, yeah, a lot of what uh, went on later in the Gospels came out of the philosophy of, of Akhenaten, yes, it's true. So how do, um, we, how do we get now from Akhenaten to Jesus? Your first, one of your first books, correct me if I'm wrong, is Jesus, Last of the Pharaohs. Um, mm. How do we get from, from the 18th dynasty and Akhenaten to Jesus? Yeah, um, a long story, actually, but I'll try and cut it short because we can come back and we could concentrate on the intermediate parts later. Sure. Um, so Akhenaten is in Egypt. He is thrown out of Egypt on the second exodus. 
So we have two now uh, exoduses of these people out from Egypt. And they go out to Jerusalem. And from history, they go out across the Mediterranean. So they go to Crete. They have strong links with the uh, Minoans. They go to Argos, which is Greece. There are strong connections with the Spartans, uh, who are, you know, arose later within Egypt. Uh, they went out to the Mediterranean islands, to Sardinia, to the Balearics. And they established themselves in these locations across the Mediterranean. And they grew stronger and stronger in these islands. And then in the 12th century, so not too long afterwards, um, you know, 150, 200 years, they came back to Egypt in one of the strangest episodes from recorded history that nobody has been able to explain, except for myself. When we have the Sea People invasion. So for no particular reason, all of the islands of the Mediterranean came together in a great coalition and sent a thousand ships to Egypt to conquer Egypt. So why did these small island peoples spread across the Mediterranean suddenly think they could gang up together in a coalition and defeat the superpower of the region, Egypt herself? Makes no sense. We know it happened because it's written on the walls of um, Ramesses III um, at um, Medinet Habu, I think it is, his big temple there. And you can see all of the friezes of these battles with the sea people. So who were the sea people? They were the returning Israelites. They were the Hyksos. That's why they came back to Egypt, because that was their original homeland that they'd been kicked out of some for up to 400 years because you know the first exodus was 1570 1580 bc um, and they came back to retake their homeland and they had been a you know the hyksos had been the most militarized people in the whole of the mediterranean it wasn't as if um, they didn't know how to wage war all they needed is the resources we, we know this because going back to the uh, uh, Hyksos Exodus, one of the major things in the biblical story of the Exodus is the destruction of Jericho. A very famous episode where the whole of Jericho was destroyed and every man, woman, child and beast within Jericho were all killed. Again, that can't be found in the historical record. and Nobody knows where this story came from because they're all looking in the wrong era. But if you look in an earlier era, if you look to the 1580s BC, the people who destroyed Jericho are known to have been the Hyksos pharaohs of Egypt. So we come back to the Israelites being the Hyksos again. Mm. They are the same people. And they did the same again in the 1100s BC. They came back into Egypt on their boats as the Sea People invasion. And they sailed up the Nile and they destroyed and they retook most of Egypt. And they reestablished themselves in Egypt as the United Monarchy. Um, and again, we don't have time to go through this, but um, the other people who are missing from the historical record are King Solomon and King David. Now, there's been a lot of archeology span in, in Israel by the likes of Silberman and uh, Fulkenstein. And they have come to the conclusion that during the United Monarchy, Israel was no, uh, sorry, Jerusalem was no more than a village. So there was no united monarchy. The whole story of David and Solomon 
is wrong. It's incorrect. It never happened. There was no such powerful kings in this region, in this era. However, if you look a little laterally at this, if the story is going to be true, we're either looking in the wrong era or we're looking in the wrong location. And in this case, we're looking in the wrong location. We should be looking in Egypt. So their capital city was not in Zion, it was in Zoan. And Zoan is in the Nile Delta, it's Tanis. So when these sea people came back, they reestablished themselves in the Nile Delta. And we have a fairly good idea that this, this was the era of the judges. So if you're looking in the biblical story, this is the era of the judges. And we have a fairly good idea that uh, this is part of the same story because there are so many similarities between the two. Uh, for instance, Ramesses III, in his battles with the sea peoples, he says the sea people came towards them bearing fire, holding fire before them. Uh, that was obviously their technique. This was a nighttime um, attack on the Egyptians. And if you go into the judges, um, I think it was Gideon. Yeah, I think it was. He came into battle against his foes. He came into battle with fire before him. They had pots, and inside the pots they kept their burning brands so they could sneak up on their enemy. And when they were surrounding their enemy, they broke their pots, they took out the burning brands, and then they charged upon their enemy to cause confusion and fear. It was the same technique. So were they copying each other, or were they the same people? Mm. I think the evidence is strong that these were the same people. And they established themselves in the Nile Delta as the United Monarchy of Egypt. And it so happens that if you look at the history uh, of the biblical United Monarchy, David and Solomon, it is exactly the same as the 21st dynasty of Egypt. And I won't go through it now because that's probably a topic for an another time. Yeah. But those two dynasties are exactly the same in every detail, except, of course, that one of them was Egyptian. And you can see why they wouldn't want to admit this. So, you know, you're a rabbi, or even a Christian, but Christians don't care so much about the United Monarchy, but if you're a rabbi uh, teaching your flock, are you going to teach them that the United Monarchy of the Israelites was Egyptian, who worshipped most of the Egyptian gods. Of course, if you look at the um, if you look at the Tanakh, Solomon and David did worship. It, it it goes through all of the gods that the these two kings worshipped, and they they weren't monotheists by any means. They were worshipping at least five different gods, mm -hmm. including the Queen of Heaven, who is Isis. So even within the biblical story, they were not monotheist by any means. Um, queen Macca, who was a slightly later queen, um, the um, mother of Asa, I think, I forget anyway, she was a, a later uh, queen of the... Um, uh, slightly later than the United Monarchy. And she was caught worshipping a, um, what it calls in the Bible, it calls it a, an idol. This is in the uh, King James Version, and it calls it an idol. And uh, in the, and I'm not going to pronounce this correctly, but in the Hebrew, it's a mislatheth, which uh, I can never pronounce. But anyway, if you look at the Vulgate, which gives it to you in Latin, it's called a priapus. And that probably doesn't help people very much either, um, because uh, if your Latin is not up to scratch. 
but if you translate a Priapus, uh, it's a penis. So Queen Maka was worshipping a penis. She was worshipping a phallic symbol. Mm. And of course, these great uh, Egyptian obelisks, they were phallic symbols. That was part of their symbolism. Um, so it was perfectly correct. The Israelites the, the, of the United Monarchy were worshipping uh, pretty much all of the gods of Egypt. So that takes us up to sort of the 10th century. Um, then we have the divided monarchy because there was a, there was a dispute, as there often is, between uh, the sons of the father. And uh, they split. They were split into two sections, the divided monarchy. Um, one of the sons stayed in what they called Judea, and the other one uh, went to Israel. Now, that's said to be a division between Jerusalem and northern Israel, and that's where they split. But I think the division was between Egypt, between the Nile Delta, and Judea, or Israel as we call it now. And that was the divided monarchy. And so now we have these people actually living um, in Judea, which they'd not been doing very much up until that time. They'd been mostly in Egypt. Um, then we have the Babylonian exile, which I go through as well. That's quite important. And then we come through to the first century BC. And we have the same people sort of in power, because remember the Greeks now are in power in Egypt. It's now Ptolemaic Egypt. So we have a, a Greek dynasty. But remember these Greeks, these Macedonians, have links with the Hyksos anyway, because that's where they went to during the Hyksos exodus. Mm. So we have uh, immediate links then to the Greeks. They married into the uh, pharaonic line in Egypt when they were in Egypt. So we have this Greco-Egyptian monarchy in the first century BC in Egypt, who were related to the ex-Israelites. Um, and they were ginger again. We have this thread of ginger mm. that runs through the pharaonic line, uh, you know, from Yuya to Akhenaten to Ramesses the uh, second, all the way through to Cleopatra, who was most definitely ginger haired. Uh, You'd expect ginger hair to be uh, Northern European? Well, no, I think it went to Northern Europe. I don't think it came from Northern Europe. Right. I think um, lots of people will say that, you know, the Celts came down into Egypt, you know, and that's how that phenotype arrived in Egypt. I think it went the other way. Right. Because we have the story of Queen Scota, yep. uh, which I write about in my book, uh, Scota, Egyptian Queen of the Scots. And the history of Scotland... So this is quite early. This comes from Scotty Chronicon, which is uh, 14th century uh, AD. And it comes from the Laboil of um, Gabala, which is an Irish history from the 6th century. And these books say that the Scots and the Irish came from Egypt. They were more exiles from Egypt. And they came, and this is why I like this particular um, history, this particular manuscript, they came from the dynasty of Akhenaten. Which is odd because the dynasty of Akhenaten had been deleted from history because he was the heretic pharaoh. And so later pharaohs deleted from him from history. Nobody knew about him apart from the Scots. And the Scots wrote about this history about Queen Scota. And if you look at the ancestry of Queen Scota, it's quite obvious that she is a daughter of Akhenaten. She is Ankesenamun. Um, and her husband is I, Pharaoh I, who goes missing at this time. And the early history of Ireland and Scotland says that Ankesenamun and Pharaoh I go on this exodus because they were kicked out of Egypt, of course. This was the end of the Amarna re regime. It was hanging on by its fingertips, you know. Akhenaten had been 
um, sent into exile, oh, I don't know, maybe 20 years before. Um, and then we had uh, Tutankhamun, and then we had Pharaoh I came onto the throne, who was, he was strongly related to this family. I say he was probably the father of Tutankhamun. Um, but anyway, he was closely related. And um, he was kicked out as well. So where did he go to? We don't know, except that Scottish history, early Scottish history, says he went to Ireland and then to Scotland. Well, they went to Spain first. They, they set up a colony uh, on the Ebro River uh, in eastern Spain. And then later they went round to Ireland and Scotland. Um, so that's one route by which this... Um, ginger gene could get to northern Europe right. because they populated Scotland and Ireland, which is where all the redheads are. And so this is a very alternative view again, Ralph, because like Michael Petarian <laughs> and people like that, they tend to think it's the other way, right? Yes, they do. Um, but they have no particular evidence apart from the similarities in the genotypes. And we've established um, the similarities, you know, recent studies have established the links between Northern Europeans and Egypt. And so they say, oh, they must have come from Northern Europe. Well, no, it can easily be the other way around. Mm. We have a genotype and a phenotype. Um, the phenotype being the, the ginger hair could easily have come from Egypt because this was very early. I mean, they were kicked out of, of Egypt in uh, 1320 BC. We don't have a history of Scotland and Ireland from 1320 BC. All we have is, is one or two burials uh, and some vague uh, mythologies, but we don't have a real history from Scotland in that era. Mm. So we're guessing. They have come across one or two burials. There's an interesting burial um, at Tara where they found the Egyptian prince, as they called him. Uh, there was an interesting discovery in mold in North Wales, which was of an Egyptian style uh, burial cape. Uh, and they also found again an Egyptian necklace. Um, so there were contacts in this early era with this region. So is this the explanation? I think it is, you know, um, there is obviously a connection between the two, between sort of um, Ireland, Scotland and Egypt. Uh, which way did it travel? Mm. Well, I think the logical thing is to go with the history we have. And the history we have is that exiles from Egypt went to Ireland and Scotland in a very, very early era and settled in those regions uh, from which we get the uh, ginger haired phenotype in, in the north of Europe. Um, Yes, it does upset things a little bit in historical terms, but it's, it's logical. We have the history, why not believe it? Um, of course, it's denounced as being mythology, but it fits. It, it fits with the history of, of people coming through um, uh, Spain, because Spain has the same name as Scotland. One is Iberia, the other is called Hibernia. Mm. Um, which is supposed to have come from the son of this Egyptian queen uh, who was called Heba. Um, they say that's a, a back construction, you know, someone trying to reconstruct this history going backwards, but it could easily just as well be a history going forwards, and that's the proper explanation. Um, yeah, it's another part of this jigsaw puzzle, and it does fit. All you've got to do is have the, the courage to actually believe it and not dismiss it just because it's mythology and it's not real history. Because well, there are little bits of real history that back it up. You know, the archaeology does, does back it up. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, we end up with this G ginger phenotype. And, of course, many of the Greeks were ginger as well. Uh, you know, if you look at the Trojan Wars, they're all called golden haired uh, within Greece, even though if you look at Greeks today, you know, the vast majority are black haired, of course. Yeah. 
but this there was this idea that the monarchy was was all golden head um even if you look at um uh, Alexander the Great, he appears to be a redhead as well. Yeah. Um, and Cleopatra was, and she was, you know, she was Greek. She was at least sort of, you know, 80% Greek and maybe 20% uh, Egyptian. Um, she was ginger head. We have her images from Pompeii and from Herculaneum. And remember, these images uh, were from AD 76, when did Vesuvius blow up. It was about AD 76, something of that nature. Um, so these are very early images, uncorrupted by time. These were written, written. These pieces were created only a century after Cleopatra was actually alive. Uh, and they show her as being ginger head. Mm. Um, I'm not sure how we got onto this ginger. Oh, we were going up to the court. We were, we were going up towards the Gospels, weren't we? We were in Solomon, uh, 21st dynasty, we were, I think, just moving through that. Yeah, so, um, and then we go into the Gospel era. How long have we got for this? Because we could if, sort of... Do you, wanna, do you want five minutes? Uh, how long have you got? Oh, I've, I've got as much time as you like, really. Um, I've got no, to about 11, on. so there's 55 minutes. As long as my water keeps on going, I'm, I'm okay. I get a bit dry throated sometimes, but That's uh, okay. yeah. We yeah, can, let's carry on then. Yeah, let's go for it, yeah. Um, so we come into the first century and we have this odd story um, about a king because Jesus was called a king. He was called a king on his birth and he was called a king uh, at his crucifixion. Um, you know, and if, if you sing the old uh, Christmas carols. We're just coming into the Christmas carol season again. Um, born was a king of Israel, all of that sort of stuff, you know. Well, why keep calling this guy a carpenter if he was a king? He was called a king of the Jews. Let's call him a king of the Jews. Let's take that as being reality instead of being, um, you know, just a, a strange mythology. So we're looking for this odd king who was born in a stable. He was born in a state of some sort of poverty. Somewhere in Judea, Syria, in about AD 4, who was visited by the Persian Magi, the Persian priests and kingmakers. Why would the Persians be interested in the birth of this strange carpenter king. It makes no sense. He was supposed to be a Jew. Why were the Persians coming to have a look at him? How do we tie all of that together into a co cohesive history, a real history? How can we have a king like this Jesus guy who has been lost from the historical record? I mean, how can you, how can you lose a king in the first century AD? Doesn't seem possible, does it? But we have, there is a lost king from the first century. Um, and his name was King Esus. So how did we arrive at this guy? Well, back in the um, early first century BC, uh, during the reign of uh, Octavian Augustus, um, he sent into exile uh, the sons and daughters of Queen Cleopatra. So Queen Cleopatra died, um, AD, uh, sorry, BC 30s. Her children went into uh, the sort of um, uh, the empire's crash, I suppose you could call it, the um, um, I'm just trying to think. Um, the the emperor's crash. Um, Octavian, uh, uh, part of the Roman Empire, it's what they always used to do. They used to take in uh, princes from all around the empire in order to Romanize them, to turn them into good Romans. They did this all the time with the uh, peoples they uh, conquered. 
they took a British king into, uh, into prison, but of course it wasn't a real prison. It was, it was a luxurious uh, sort of palace. Yeah. And uh, he was taken uh, and shown all of the delights, all of the benefits of being Roman before being allowed to go back to uh, Britain to become a king of Britain. That's how they sort of Romanized these uh, new colonies. Wow. And they did exactly the same with uh, Cleopatra's children. They took them into uh, care in Rome. Uh, we're, not happen we're not sure what happened to her sons because they sort of disappeared from the um, uh, historical record. But the daughters were married off to uh, client kings around the empire. So her older daughter, no correction, younger daughter, who's Cleopatra Selene, was married off to King Yuba II of uh, Mauritania, uh, which is sort of North Africa. Um, and then they had another daughter who was, um, I say her name was uh, Queen Theomusa Aurania. And she was sold off to the king of Parthia, who was Phraates IV. Because we have this strange tale of this uh, strange concubine being sold off. This is a, a story again from Josephus Flavius. We have this uh, strange story about this concubine being sold off, given as a diplomatic bride to the king of Persia. Now, uh, Yuba II had just got a daughter of... Queen Cleopatra as his bride. And yet the um, king of Persia just got this uh, concubine, which is ridiculous because the big enemy of Rome was the Parthians, the Persians, not the North Africans. Mm. And so he would have to have the most illust illustrious gift ever. And if you look at the history, it so happens that it's quite likely that Cleopatra had another daughter with um, Empress um, Caesar in, um, uh, in about 43 BC. So this lost daughter, which is meant, who is mentioned by uh, Cicero, was given as a diplomatic bride to the king of Persia or Parthia in about 20 BC. Now she became the queen of Persia and she was kicked out of Persia in about AD 4. So here we have a lost monarch who was kicked out of Parthia or Persia in AD 4, in a state of poverty, without a palace to live in. And she goes to Syria, Judea. Um, and this is a queen who would have been visited if there was a birth at this time from her or from her daughter, would have been visited by the Persian Magi. Because any son born to that family would have been a possible king of Persia. And yeah, this is a, a lost um, royal family because I've never heard of them. And I don't suppose many of your listeners would have heard of them either. This was Queen Thea Musa Aurania of Parthia. And she settled in what we now call Syria at a place called Edessa. So it's very, very much a lost history. And yes, they would have been visited by the Persian Magi because any son born to them would have been a potential king of all of Persia. So here is the Biblical nativity story, almost exactly as it's written. And from that, we can follow this history down and we can see that the Gospels are actually a, a fairly good history of what happened in this region at this time. Again, it's a history that uh, has been mythologized. Uh, I say that it's uh, been sprinkled with fairy dust uh, in order to confuse people as to, you know, the, the true nature of this history. 
Um, and so it's become detached from real history because we don't know who these people are. And yet they can all be found in the historical record. If we do one small adjustment, because again, we come back to this situation we had with the United Monarchy. Um, they don't exist in the historical record in the 10th century BC in Judea. They're just not there. The way you find them is you relocate them back into Egypt and suddenly you find them. Same happened with this story as well. If you look for the Jesus character and all of these events from the gospel era, uh, you cannot find any of that in the historical record. Totally missing. All of the characters, all of the events, all missing from the historical record. So you've only got two, choice, two choices, maybe three choices, but anyway, the major two are perhaps we're looking in the wrong location or perhaps we're looking in the wrong era. And in this case, they've deliberately put us off the scent by making us look into the wrong era. Um, so none of this happened in the AD 30s, as the Gospels will try to make out. It all happened in the AD 60s. Right. And that's how they covered up the story. Um, but we, we know that it happened in the AD 60s. You've only got to read the Gospels to find that out. I mean, Jesus himself describes the siege of Jerusalem. Now, it's said that that was prophecy, but he describes the siege of Jerusalem, and that didn't happen until AD 68, late AD 60. Um, Jesus laments the death of um, Zacharias Baruch. Okay, but he didn't die until AD 68, during the Jewish revolt. And, and Jesus also, he, he mocks, and I, I think I'm the first person to really discover this. He mocks Ben Zizit uh, Hakaseth. And again, people probably won't know who that is. Uh, you've got to read the Talmud in order to find out who this guy is. But he is mocked for his love of finery um, in the Talmud in exactly the way that Jesus mocks this guy in the Gospel story. So it's quite obvious that he is mocking uh, Ben Zizek Hakeseth. It's a play on his name. His name rhymes with all of the um, finery that he was accused of having. Okay. Um, but he was an aristocrat in AD 68. Nothing to do with the AD 30s. So if you start looking in the AD 60s, suddenly it all comes out of the woodwork suddenly we find the whole of the gospel story. It's all sitting there waiting. Um, Which as long as you have... look in the right era, yeah. Wow. Your knowledge blows my head off. It's, uh... it's, yeah, it's just, you know, 40 years of reading, I suppose, you know. Um, yeah, the, I mean, it's, this is not from a, a script, you know, I'm not reading a script. This is just, you know. Yeah. Um, 40 years of indulging myself in this information because, uh, you know, as I said before, I was forced to earlier on um, because people ask questions, you know, why don't you believe this? And then it became an interest and I was just amazed at how much you could pick up from this story. Mm. Um, so many people have looked at this story and not found any similarities between this story and real history. And suddenly, every time I looked, I, I found bits of real history, which were just popping out of the woodwork. And that made it interesting. You know, there was a discovery at every turn. Um, if you open your eyes, you can never see this if you have closed eyes. If you're wedded to the idea that Jesus died in AD 33, AD 30 or 33, you will never see this. No, you've, shut up, you've shut yourself off straight away, haven't you? You point. do. Um, and that's, that's a real problem. So theologians will not see this. And historians will never see this. Because they have a historical structure that is almost as rigid as any theologian. I'm not sure why, but uh, I, I think it's to do with the academic environment that you're brought up with this historical 
historical structure that you're taught when you come through university. And therefore that is what you teach mm. um, when you yourself become a professor. And to stray from that is to risk falling off the academic ladder. Yeah, yeah. You know, there are many academics have been thrown out of university because they had strange ideas. This is happening more and more actually in recent times, especially with things like, you know, climate science and so on. If you disagree yeah. with the consensus, you're out of the door. And that's been happening quite a lot. And it happens in history as well, because you, not for the same reasons, I think. <clears throat> I think within history, you know, if you've started teaching this and you've been teaching this for 20 years, maybe 30 years, and then some little pipsqueak like myself comes along and says, whatever you, you know, everything you've been teaching for the last 30 years is all wrong. Well, how, how can you admit that yeah. to yourself? You know, um, it's impossible. You can't go back and say, well, you know, sorry, everything I've taught over the last 30 years has all been completely incorrect. Sorry, students, you know, I got it wrong. Never mind. Um, that's very difficult. That's why they always say that um, discoveries uh, only advance, discoveries within academia and science only advance one death at a time. You have to have the old guard dying and, and leaving academia and the new guard maybe coming in with fresh ideas behind them. Yeah. And so it, it, it'll be a long time before any ideas change within academia. And so, yeah, they've missed it. They've missed this story. Um, whereas I think I've found the correct story because again, you know, coming back to the jigsaw puzzle, all the pieces fit in. And it becomes predictive that, you know, the pieces not only fit in, they predict what will happen in the future. And this has happened on, on several occasions, many occasions with myself, where later research confirms what I've said in the past. Because remember, I started, the first book was written back in 97, I think it was. Uh, so it's a long time ago. And yet data that's come out recently has backed up what I said back in 97. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, one was Arthurian legend. I, I did a book on King Arthur because I found lots of similarities there. And King Arthur, um, the Arthurian manuscripts tell the same story because the great hero of Arthurian legend is Joseph of Arimathea, the guy who took Jesus down from the cross. Mm. So a lot of Arthurian legend is to do with this era and this particular story. And Arthurian legend has the same problem with this, what I call the chronological chasm, the gap between the AD 30 story and the AD 70 story, this 40 year chasm. Um, and Arthurian legend has the same problem because it's talking about Joseph of Arimathea. And the problem is, it says that Joseph of Arimathea was a soldier working for Emperor Vespasian for seven years. Now that's a problem because Emperor Vespasian was an AD 70s emperor, not an AD 30s character. Mm. So how does Jesus take, sorry, how does Joseph take uh, Jesus down from the cross in AD 30 and then also be working for the space in, in AD 70. Yeah. Well, the answer within Arthurian legend is they make Joseph of Arimathea go to sleep. So he takes Jesus down from the cross in AD 30. He's then put in prison. He goes to sleep for three days and he wakes up 40 years later. <laughs> and now he's in AD 70. And now he can talk to Vespasian and be a soldier working for Emperor Vespasian. You see how this chronological chasm gets in the way of all yeah. of the history of the first century. Um, and they have to sort of try and get around it. Now that I discovered 20 years after I'd already said that this chasm exists. And then I read Arthurian legend 
and I came, came across the same chasm. Um, another thing I predicted was what Jesus looked like. Uh, we'll we'll go, go through this in a minute, but he, he turns out to be a king. We've already said he was a king. He was a king of Edessa in northern um, Syria. Yeah. And so I drew a picture of what he should look like, which was on the cover of my book, Jesus, King of Edessa. And so I had him dressed as an Edessan king with Roman armor, ginger hair, um, a diadem, a headband, a uh, purple cloak, which is important. We must talk about the uh, purple cloak uh, and stockings because the uh, Parthians always wore stockings. The, the Greeks and the Romans didn't, but the Parthians always wore stockings. Um, and then lo and behold, after I'd made this picture, they discovered a mosaic in, in, um, uh, in Israel, just to the northwest of uh, Galilee, of um, Bar Kamza, who is a character in the Talmud. And ludicrously, they said that this was a, um, uh, an image of Alexander the Great. So if you want to look this up on the net, you have to look up Hukuk Mosaic, Alexander the Great. Um, that's the only way you'll actually find it because they misinterpreted who it was and they deliberately, this is what I hate about ac academia. They sold an exclusive to National Geographic and they held back all of the images so that National Geographic would have an exclusive for their magazine and for which the academics were paid thousands and thousands of dollars to have this nice exclusive. Um, but National Geographic wanted a splash for their headline. They wanted someone famous for their headline. So the headline was Mosaic of Alexander the Great, because he's well known, people will know who he is. But the guy has uh, a Jewish pilot a curly side lock of hair. Alexander the Jew. Hmm. Doesn't really sort of um, ring true, does it? It was a total misidentification for cash. It was selling uh, history for cash. Archaeology for cash. In reality, the mosaic is of Bar Kamza, who nobody knows about. Like, you can see why they didn't want that as a headline. Right. Mosaic of Barkamza discovered. <laughs> who? <laughs> who, who's Barkamza? <laughs> Nobody knows. In fact, even if you talk to Jewish people, they won't know who Barkamza is yeah. because he only exists within um, the Talmud. But if you look up the Talmud, it has exactly the same scenario as this particular mosaic um, Barkamza and the elephant and his army. So Bar Kamza was the leader of the Jewish revolt. AD 68 again, we're back to our favorite era. And he took a calf from uh, Emperor Nero and gave this calf as an offering to the high priest of Jerusalem. That's why in the mosaic, it, it has um, Bar Kamza and the calf. And he gave the calf so that the Jewish priesthood would reject it. He knew they would reject it because it was, it, it was a um, non-kosher calf. It was uh, a Gentile calf. How could they accept it? So they uh, rejected it. And therefore they upset Nero and hopefully that would spark the, um, uh, the Jewish revolt, the, uh, the big civil war with Rome in Judea, which it did. So it was a tactic in order to start the Jewish revolt. And it is on this particular mosaic. And of course, Bar Kamza is our Jesus character. Uh, and we'll go through why this is in, in a minute. But um, of course, on the mosaic, he's portrayed with a ginger hair and a beard, uh, a Jewish pilot, because Jesus was a Jew, of course. Um, a diadema headband because he was a king. That was a, a symbol of the monarchy. Uh, Roman armor, um, a purple cloak, 
and stockings, exactly as I portrayed him on the front of my book. Because in my book, I'd already said that Jesus was, was Bar Kamsa in my book. Uh, and I said this like four years before it was, this particular mosaic was discovered. Wow. So I was predicting what would actually be discovered in the future, and it was discovered. So I was, I was quite pleased and amazed by that, that my books were prophetic. They could actually um, tell us what we would be discovering in the future. Um, yeah, so how did we get to... So King, King is S. Manu of Edessa. Yes. Um, mm. Yeah, talk so yes, more about that. that. Again, another of these monarchs that nobody has heard about. Um, this is how you can lose a monarch from history. This is how you can lose the Jesus character because he was deleted from history. And he was deleted from history by Josephus Flavius, who was the last man standing uh, after the Jewish revolt. Josephus Flavius was a, a Jewish commander um, who changed sides and started working for the Romans. And he became their chief propaganda minister. And he's the guy who wrote the history of the Jewish war and the history of the Jewish people and everything else. Um, and he was working for the Romans, of course. He was writing these books, not just for himself. He was writing them for the Romans. And what the Romans wanted to do is they wanted to delete this history, the history of this Jewish revolt, this great war with Rome, um, because they didn't want anyone else thinking that they could rebel against Rome. So they wanted to delete this from history, and he did. So Joseph of Flavius deleted these particular monarchs from history. If it wasn't for some of the other historians uh, in this region, we would have no idea that these people existed. That's how you delete a monarchy from history, and that's exactly what happened. So how do we get to this point? Well, we had this monarchy who was kicked out of Parthia. We've already been through them. And they re-established themselves in Syria. That was Queen Thea Musa Orania. She's the real queen that came out of Parthia. We have her coins, we know who she is. Um, she's mentioned by Josephus Flavius. And actually everyone thought that this was a ribald story by Josephus because nobody knew who this queen was until they started discovering her coins um, in, uh, uh, in Persia. Um, and they settled in Edessa. Now, initially when they came out, when, when I wrote this story in my Cleopatra to Christ, I thought they came out of Parthia with nothing. So they just kicked out of the country. Later, it sort of transpired that they, um, they left of their own accord with half of the uh, Persian treasury. So they might have not had a palace to stay in, in uh, Edessa, but they were not poor. They were the richest monarchy in the whole of the East. And with that money, they were able to establish themselves to build a, um, a new city-state, new capital city, in fact, two capital cities, Edessa and Palmyra, and become very influential. And they were Jews, of course. Now, I say that they were Egypto-Jews because they were Nazarenes, and we have this again from the Talmud, uh, but one of their daughters, the daughter of Queen Theomusa Orania, was Queen Helena. Again, another monarch that people won't know about, but she became the Queen of Judea in AD 50. Yes, Judea had a queen. Again, she's been deleted from history because even the Jews don't want to, to mention that they had a queen. But Queen Helena had the largest palace and the largest tomb in Jerusalem. And she is the one who furnished the Temple of Jerusalem and she bought the, the giant solid gold menorah for the Temple of Jerusalem. 
she was stupendously rich and she was the queen of Judea. Now her power base initially was Edessa. And we know that because again, they've been deleting this history. So it's very, very difficult to put this history together. And for hundreds of years, people have been put off by um, Josephus Flavius because he says that they were the kings and queens of Adiabeni, which is supposed to be Mosul, way over in, you know, beyond the Tigris. Um, uh, it's actually a little town just to the um, east of Mosul. Anyway, so Josephus Flavius and all historians since have put people off the scent by saying that they were the kings and ke queens of Adiabeni. But if you look at the uh, Syriac historians, the Syriac historians say that Queen Helena was the wife of King Agbarus of Edessa. So now we know where this mysterious Adiabeni place is, that nobody really knows where it is because there was no history whatsoever of this uh, place called Adiabeni, it was actually Edessa, and we know where Edessa is. It's modern San Lurfa. It's now in Turkey, but it used to be in sort of northern Syria. <clears throat> and the king of Edessa was Abgarus, again, another king that people have probably not heard of. And his queen was Queen Helena, the famous Queen Helena, who became the queen of Judea. So now we've sort of discovered this, this lost monarchy, which has been deleted from history deliberately. It doesn't occur anywhere in the um, works of Josephus. You know, you can, you can put in a search function for Edessa or Abgarus, and it will just say, nothing found. Um, so we have this lost monarchy and they are mentioned sort of within the gospels so within acts of the apostles there is a story about uh agabus and the latins tend to say agabus whereas the syriacs will say abgarus um, there is a story of agabus giving financial aid for a famine in judea now we know what this event was because we have another history of it from the Talmud and also from the Syriac historians saying that that money was given by Queen Helena to the people of Jerusalem because there was a famine down in Judea. So we have this event, we think it was the AD 47 famine and the Edessa monarchy were giving financial aid because of this famine. The odd thing is that in Acts of the Apostles, it is said that that financial aid was given to Jerusalem by Saul and Barnabas. So the, the character who is primary to the uh, gospel events, Saul, St. Paul, he was, the, he was an ambassador of Edessa. Now that changes the story again. So suddenly we have this, this enormous great link between Edessa and uh, the gospel story and Judea, which has been deleted from conventional history and deleted from pretty much all from gospel history as well. Uh, what's happened is, is where they're talking about um, Antioch in Acts of the Apostles, they're talking about Antioch Edessa, because Edessa was called Antioch. Um, and so suddenly, Edessa starts to become a central component within the gospel story, which is interesting. We're getting closer and closer to our destination. You know, we have this forgotten family who we, we've said came out of um, Persia, hence the uh, Persian Magi who settled in Edessa, who are now somehow linked to the gospel story. Well, of course, their son 
was called Isis. And I think it is from that name that we get the um, Judaic Jesus. It is said that that name comes from uh, uh, Joshua, Joshua. But I don't think it does. I think that's a later addition to it. I think it came from the uh, Persian Isis, which is why if you go out into Mesopotamia today, uh, Jesus is actually called Esa, Isa. It comes from the name Jesus. So that is my contention, is that the son of this monarchy was the King Jesus, Not the King Jesus of the AD 30s that they're trying to point at, but the King Jesus of the AD 60s. Because <clears throat> this son of this royal family became the leader of the Jewish revolt. So now we're back to this Jewish revolt business. And we've already seen that Bar Kamza was the leader of the Jewish revolt. Mm -hmm. Now we see that King Jesus was also the leader of the Jewish revolt. <clears throat> and we have another leader of the Jewish revolt who is mentioned in the works of Josephus. And his name was Jesus. So the leader in the, of the Jewish revolt in the works of Josephus was Jesus of Gamala, which I say is another incarnation, another name for this Prince Jesus person, because they're all said to be the leader of the Jewish revolt, and they have very, very similar lives. Um, and there is lots of evidence for this. This is not a, 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 a attribution made in isolation. There is a whole plethora of evidence that, that revolves around it. And one of the main aspects of this is the identity of Saul himself. So again, we have this influential character, Saul, St. Paul, Paul yeah. and we don't know who he is in the historical record. And yet Saul was the guy who created Christianity. Remember, Saul was the apostle to the Gentiles. He is the, the person who started what I call simple Judaism, because Jesus was a Jew. He, he, he was not a Christian. Jesus had nothing to do with Christianity. Christianity was, was a simple Judaism created by Saul. And Saul went to James, the brother of Jesus, and said, look, can I preach to the Gentiles? Because they seem to be interested in this. And he said, yes. <clears throat> and here are the um, four rules of simple Judaism. Judaism for Gentiles. And they were, uh, do not indulge in fornication, do not drink blood, um, do not eat um, uh, strangled animals. Again, this is because of the blood prohibition and something else, I can't remember. But anyway, we ended up with these um, four very simple rules of simple Judaism. <clears throat> and it is from Saul's simple Judaism that Christianity was born, which is why Christianity is not Judaism which is why Christians don't have to be circumcised, which is why they don't have to keep kosher. It is not Judaism. It is simple Judaism for Gentiles, and it was created by uh, Saul, St. Paul, mm. not by Jesus. So anyone who is a Christian is following the religion of the enemy of Jesus. They wouldn't agree with that, but that's exactly what they're doing, because the church of uh, Saul became the dominant church and it pushed aside the church of Jesus and James. But who is this character? So we have this very important character who created history, uh, who created Christianity. Um, who is he in the historical record? Well, he's, he's just not there. There is no such person. Um, unless we start looking at similar attributes. So if we look at people in this era with similar attributes, you will find a person 
who has multiple similarities with Saul, including both being sent on a prison ship as prisoners, uh, being sent to Rome. But the ship was uh, shipwrecked on Malta, and then they were rescued. They swam to shore, they were rescued and taken uh, on another ship to Naples to go and meet Emperor uh, Nero. How many Jewish prisoners in this era were taken to see Nero and had a shipwreck? You know? um, they were either two people on the same ship or they are one and the same person. And both of these characters turned out to be prolific writers and both used the same publisher, Epaphroditus. And both ended up chasing a guy called Jesus around Galilee. So in the gospel story, we have Jesus saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And in the historical record, this same character that we're talking about was chasing a guy called Jesus of Gamala all over Galilee. And you've got to ask yourself, how was Saul committing Christians to prison? So we have this guy called Saul uh, in the AD um, 60s, chasing uh, proto-Christians around Galilee and committing them to prison. Under what authority did he do that? How was he able to do that? Well, as this alternate character, we know exactly how he was able to do that. So the alternate character we're looking at, who is so similar to Saul, is Josephus Flavius. And Josephus Flavius could arrest these people, Jesus of Gamala, around Galilee in the 1860s, because he was the army commander in charge of Galilee at that time. That's why he was chasing these people around. But of course, Joseph, um, Josephus was a slimy toad. And <clears throat> as soon as the um, Jewish revolt started, he changed sides and became a Roman. He had a flash of inspiration on the road to Damascus and he became a Roman. Um, the story is the same story. So we have this same old problem for the believers. What I'm saying is this is all real history. I know who this character is. I know what your story is about. The gospels are true. And they will say, Christians will say, oh, no, it's not. No, it's not. No, you haven't. Why? Because my history has insurmountable problems embedded within it. Um, this link between Saul and Josephus means that Jesus was alive in the AD 60s. That's a problem. He, was, he, he didn't die on the cross in the AD 30s. So that's the first problem. The second problem is that Josephus was the slimiest, treacherous toad you've ever seen in the whole of history. Nobody in their right mind would want Josephus as being the prime leader who wrote the gospel story. He was the most untrustworthy, lying charlatan um, and um, traitor there has been ever in history. So by all means, a Christian has to deny that Saul was Josephus, <clears throat> even though the story fits. <clears throat> coming back to the um, coming back to the old uh, jigsaw puzzle. If you don't know this, then none of the pieces fit whatsoever. You can never find these people in the historical record. If you know that Josephus was Saul all of the pieces fit together perfectly. Mm. And yet they have to deny that that jigsaw puzzle is true and the picture we have drawn on that puzzle is the correct picture 
because it gives too many uh, problems for Christianity. In fact, they're insurmountable. So they have to deny it, even though they can see it's a true history. So how did, how did King Jesus of Edessa become the Jesus that we know of today as the figurehead of Christianity? Is that through the Council of Nicosia? Yes. So this Jesus of Gamala and King Jesus of Edessa are the same person. Mm. We know that because they were both the leader of the Jewish revolt. And it's the same name. Jesus, Jesus is the same name. Yeah. And they were both the leader of the Jewish revolt. So again, either you've got two very closely related, very similar characters who are both uh, co-leaders of the revolt, or they are the same person. So <clears throat> that is the Jesus character. How did he become, excuse me, <coughs> how did he become the um, Jesus character we know from Christianity? Well, that was because of Saul Josephus. You've got to remember that we have now displaced this particular story into the AD 60s and the Jewish revolt. Um, Jesus, the biblical Jesus, this King Jesus character, was waging a war against Rome for the throne of Rome. This is why when he lost this war and was captured by the Romans, he was crucified <coughs> while wearing a crown of thorns, which was the traditional crown of the Edessan kings. All of the Edessan kings wore a crown of thorns. And he was crucified wearing a purple cloak. So why did they give him a purple cloak at the crucifixion? It's because the purple cloak was a symbol of the emperor of Rome. It is a symbol that shows that Jesus was contending for the throne of Rome. He was a pretender to the throne of Rome, to be the next emperor. <clears throat> so this was not some little dispute um, in Judea. <clears throat> this was not some simple dispute in Judea. This was a major battle for the throne of Rome. He wanted to become the next emperor. That is why Jesus led this revolt against Rome. Um, that is why he was crucified wearing a purple cloak. And the kings of Edessa did exactly the same. Um, they had prom been promised their lands tax-free by the Romans, and yet the Romans had tried to tax them. That's why in the gospel story you see all these uh, mentions of this tax dispute within Rome render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar. All of his, um, you know, his, his many disciples were uh, what they call publicans in the uh, King James Bible. A publican is a, a publicanus. It's a tax collector. Uh, and uh, Matthew, I think it was, was one of the uh, tax collectors. That's what this story was about. It was a revolt against taxation from Rome. And the throne of Rome was empty. Nero had died in, in 68. Um, so the, the throne was empty for whoever could grab it. And so what we ended up with in Judea at this time was this battle between Vespasian, Commander Vespasian, and this King of Edessa, this King Jesus guy, this Jesus guy. And they were having this enormous great battle in Judea not for the fate of Judea, but for the throne of Rome. And that is why when the Jesus Jesus character lost this particular dispute, it was Vespasian who then sailed to Rome to become the next emperor. So they were battling it out in Judea for the throne of Rome. And that's why Jesus was crucified while wearing a purple cloak as a pretender for the throne of Rome. But after all the dust had settled, the Vespasians, uh, they called them the Flavian dynasty. Uh, Emperor Vespasian didn't want you to know about that. <clears throat> the last thing they wanted is, is for anyone to be promoting revolts against Rome. 
So this had to be covered up in some fashion. But this guy was too famous to cover up because he had already become the Messiah before this had all happened. He had been promoting himself as, you know, the, the, the son of God and the next Messiah and this great leader because he, the, the, the star prophecy was his prophecy. <clears throat> the great prophecy of Rome at that time, excuse me, <clears throat> the great prophecy of Rome at that time was the star prophecy, which said a star from the east would become the next emperor of Rome, not just of Rome, but the whole of the world. And who was born under the eastern star? It was Jesus, hence the star in the east. So the star prophecy belonged to Jesus, Jesus. Everyone knew about this, and so it was very difficult to cover up. So rather than trying to delete it, they just covered it with fairy dust. So instead of being a warrior monarch fighting against Rome, he became a pauper prince of peace yeah. who said, turn the other cheek to Rome. <laughs> I mean, he was just perfect, wasn't he? He was just perfect. That's exactly what Rome wanted. And so Rome wrote this story via... Um, Josephus, because Josephus was the main uh, chronicler of this history. And he was working for the Romans. He was a commander working for Emperor Vespasian. And so he wrote this story. He wrote his um, uh, Bellum, which is Jewish war, which is his story, his secular story of the Jewish revolt. And then he wrote or edited the Gospels, which was his spiritual um, story of the same event but the same story covered in fairy dust yeah uh, and so this this great gallant leader this king of Odessa suddenly became a pauper prince of peace but he's the same guy mm. and that's where the story came from and that's why the story was so important because initially Rome actually promoted this story there was no persecution in this early era. The only persecution that was in this early era was against the Church of Jesus and James, the Nazarene, the people who had started the Jewish revolt. And we know they started the Jewish revolt from the Talmud, it's, it, it tells us. We know that Jesus was involved in the uh, Jewish revolt because the Talmud tells us. The Talmud hates Jesus because he started the Jewish revolt. Jesus is Bar Kamsa in the Talmud. Uh, well, he's also called Yeshua as well, Yeshua the king. Um, but Bar Kamsa was the leader of the Jewish revolt. And we know this is Jesus because he did the same things as the biblical Jesus did in the Gospels. <clears throat> so um, they wanted to cover this up and they did it very successfully. And <clears throat> everyone went along with this same amendment of the story. So Rome went along with it because they didn't want any revolutionaries starting revolts in the uh, eastern, uh, in the eastern uh, side of the empire. The Christians went along with it because they wanted a pauper prince of peace. They didn't want a, a warrior monarch as being their leader. So they thought it was okay. And the Jews went along with it, A, because they were persecuted by the Romans, and so they couldn't say anything against the Romans. <clears throat> and so they went along with it as well. It wasn't in their interest to um, display who this guy actually was. Which is why when you read the Talmud, the character of Jesus is always covered up with a pseudonym. He's called Ben Stada, he's called Pantera, uh, he's called uh, uh, Yeshua, Yeshua the King, I think he's called, and he's called Bar Kamsa. But if you look at those pseudonyms, you can instantly see that this character they're talking about is the biblical Jesus. And in each case, pretty much, this <clears throat> character within the Talmud is always being blamed for the Jewish revolt. 
because this was the biggest calamity that had happened to the Jews. You know, they lost their country, they lost Jerusalem, and the temple was destroyed. This is why they uh, hated this particular character. This is why they said that Jesus should be boiled in semen and shit, um, because he was not their favorite character. So what you're sort of saying here is that uh, Jesus, as, as we may know, Christians may know him today, it, he would actually be the antithesis of, of Christianity. He wouldn't, it'd be completely against that. Um, yes, because he was a warrior monarch. Uh, he wasn't a pauper prince of peace. However, all of the actions he did and all of the sayings that he said were as reported. So he's, I, I liken him to the Akhenaten character again. Here is this, um, you know, you can imagine Akhenaten as this hippie type character, this cult leader of this new religion, um, setting up this, this um, new sort of cult center with all of his followers and he is doing good, you know, he is the great leader. Um, they, you know, his followers will do whatever he says. And it's all for peace and love. Well, you can imagine that with Akhenaten, you know, it's all for peace and love. And look, we're all naked in the Garden of, of Eden because, you know, all of the images of Akhenaten are of him naked, him and Nefertiti, in this wonderful sort of paradise that they created but the dark side of that is that when you look at Amana um, they were using child labor most of the workers were used and abused and had terrible um, um, physical defects bone defects you know when, when they do the archaeology uh, from the hard labor they were doing mm. That's why we get this uh, story of Pharaoh, uh, you know, within the um, uh, Torah story, where Pharaoh says, you are idle, you are idle, you must make the same number of bricks, whether there is straw or no straw. And that is portrayed, of course, as being the evil Pharaoh telling the Israelites what to do. It wasn't. It was the Israelites Israelites own leader himself, their own pharaoh, Akhenaten, telling his workers to build his new city, uh, whether they had straw or not. I want my paradise. You are idle. Go and work. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the, the peacenik hippie is, is suddenly a tyrant at the same time. But we get the same sort of um, idea with the Jesus character. So he wanted to become the uh, leader of the entire world because he was in a position to unite Rome and Egypt and Persia all together. Um, so he wanted to become the glorious, you know, um, son of God and leader of the entire world. But at the same time, he was the leader of an army that was engaged in a major war with uh, Rome in order to establish himself on this throne that he, ought, that he thought he should, uh, he should have. And yeah, so all of these people with good intentions, be, you know, can become tyrannical. Yeah. And that's exactly what the Jesus character was doing. Um, he was killing people in the name of setting up his, his marvelous new paradise. Mm -hmm. They slaughtered the whole of the um, Roman legion of Cestius at the beginning of the Jewish revolt. They caught them out in a um, pre-planned action and they wiped out the whole of his uh, army. In did, order did, to establish himself, he had to wage a, a real war. Did the Jesus figure have family? Yeah. Um, yeah, his, his wife was Mary Magdalene. Um, and that's another thing they deliberately covered up because uh, Mary Magdalene was his sister. So, um, oh, that won't be doing well. 
he had a sister wife. Well, they all did in that era. I mean, you, yeah, you look yeah. at Akhenaten, you look at uh, uh, Cleopatra, she married both of her daughters. You look at uh, Agrippa II in Judea in the first century, he married his sister, uh, Berenike. They, they all had sister wives because that's what you did within pharaonic tradition. Mm. You, you had a sister wife. Um, and so, yeah, Mary Magdalene would have been his sister as well. And we have this history from the Talmud. So we go back again to this, this character we've talked about, um, who was um, Jesus of Gamala. And we have the history of Jesus of Gamala. This was the leader of the Jewish revolt. This was the biblical Jesus. And um, who did, did he marry? He married Mary Magdalene. And we have this from the Talmud. The Talmud says that he married Mary Bothus. And both myself and Professor Robert Eisenman have identified Mary Bothus as being Mary Magdalene because they both lived at the house of Simon and they both have very, very similar histories. And of course, Mary Bothus, Mary Magdalene, married Jesus of Gamala, the biblical Jesus, the leader of the Jewish revolt. And the trouble with that, which again, they don't want you to know, which is why they cover it up. I'm sure they know the truth, but they cover it up anyway. The trouble with that is Mary Magdalene was the richest woman in, Ju in Judea. So these were not pauper carpenters. Mary Magdalene had a dowry from her, uh, her father or stepfather of one million gold denarii. Now in modern terms, that's about $20 billion. They do. Just as a marriage present. Not the wealth of the family, that was just her marriage present. And again, that changes the story. It's the same story. It's exactly the same story. But now, of course, instead of being these paupers, they are now the richest people in Judea. That's why their story was talked about. That's why they were so influential. That's why we have this history of these people because they were so influential in this era. They were aristocrats, they were monarchs and royalty. Um, but it's not the story that, you know, the church wants to sell to its, um, to its followers and believers. Mm. Mm. And so it's been changed. And that's why they can't accept it. Even though we have proven, um, you know, between uh, Professor Eisenman and myself, we've proven who these characters are, and you can locate them in the historical record. Uh, they will say, no, no, nothing to do with us. Yeah. Because it changes the story too much. I think that's what you mentioned earlier. It, I don't think it's just history and theology, though, that, that I think that's the entire academia, to be fair. I think it's, uh, it's on its backside at the moment. Yeah. Um, they cannot entertain it, um, obviously not in the, uh, theological terms, because it changes the story too much. And in historical terms, they won't accept it either, because it's too contentious. You've got to go out on a limb. You've got to put maybe your career on the line, perhaps. Um, you've got to maybe withstand the... Um, the criticism of your peers saying you're mad, you know, how can you believe this? Uh, it's very difficult for people to go out on a limb with, with information that's so different to what has been generally taught. However, all of this hangs together as a cohesive structure. It's not as if it is one idea over here and one idea over there with nothing to back it up. It's an entire cohesive picture. It's a crossword puzzle. It's a um, jigsaw puzzle where all of the pieces fit together. And there are multiple pieces, you know, I mean, these books of mine, it, it comes in a four part series. So it's a trilogy in, in four parts. Uh, we've got Cleopatra to Christ, King Jesus, Jesus King of Edessa, and the Grail Cipher. 
Now, the last three of those are 600 pages each. There's a lot of data there, a lot of information. And all of that information all points back to the same idea, the same theory, that this is all to do with the monarchy of Vanessa, the kings of Vanessa, right. um, and how they were trying to take over Judea in order, as a stepping stone, in order to take over Rome. And then, of course, you know, in, in later works, I've already gone through a couple of the uh, predictions that my work has made. Here's another one. I came across all of these similarities with um, Arthurian legend because the hero of Arthurian legend is Joseph of Arimathea. And so I looked at um, Arthurian legend, which I think came out of the Crusades because the first real history of King Arthur we have was only produced in, in 1135 after the first uh, crusaders started coming back from the Near East, which for many, many reasons, and we can go through that later if you want, uh, is why I think that this story was related to the Crusades somehow and the Near East because of um, Joseph of Arimathea. Anyway, the Crusades, when they started, and again, this is not taught very well, the Crusades started in 1196, 1096, sorry. And the Crusaders went across Anatolia uh, with their great army. And they came to the other Antioch, Antioch, which is now called Antakya, um, on the sort of northeast coast of the Mediterranean. And they were going to save Jerusalem. But they didn't go to Jerusalem. No. They carried straight on and they went to Mesopotamia. They went across the Euphrates. And guess where they went to? They went to Edessa. The first city that was liberated from uh, Muslim oppression uh, was Edessa. So why did they go to Edessa first and not to Jerusalem? I think it's because they knew something about this story. And if there was going to be any documents, any genealogies, anything of interest, any mm -hmm. histories that were still left over from the first century, they were not going to be down in Jerusalem. They were going to be held in Odessa. And of course, the Christians, the Western Christians, had had no access to Odessa whatsoever because of the Council of Nicaea in the 4th century, uh, the Council of Chalcedon in the 5th century, and the Iron Curtain of Islam, which came down in the 8th century. And it totally cut off the Eastern Church from the Western Church. And so nobody in the West had any idea what was left, what was held in Edessa. And the only way you were going to find out was to send an army across there to actually take Odessa and find out what information they had. Yeah. Now, I think that's exactly what they did. That's why the uh, Knights Templar um, split off and became so wealthy, is because they had some of this information that they had picked up from Odessa. Wow. Ralph, your knowledge is uh, out of this world, mate. Absolutely out of this world. <laughs> Um, well, it's, it's, it's a different history, isn't it? You know, it's, um, I, I don't sort of just repeat what's been said by other authors, by other historians, mm. um, other researchers. I go back to the original text. So I, I, in fact, I know very little about, you know, what other researchers are doing quite often because I don't read their works. I go back to the original text and all of this has come out of the original text with a little bit of translation with a little bit of lateral thinking, yeah. um, trying to put this back into the historical record and fitting it in. Uh, and, and it all fits so nicely. So that's why it's very different. Mm. You won't find this information in any other books. And no. 
why it's so comprehensive because it all fits together nicely it's not just one story it's a very comprehensive uh, history ralph i've got to i've got to get off uh, i could talk to you for like hours and hours would you be open to coming back on for like a, a part two i'd like to like talk to you about what's going on in the world today and your take on it yes we could do that um yeah we'll set up a um a meeting for later and we'll go through some of the interesting stuff that's going on nowadays yes um even some of the arthurian legend which is interesting yeah that would be good is there anything uh, you've got a website is it edfu books yeah it's uh, edfu-books.com uh or dot uk now as well uh the facebook site which is still there it keeps being taken off by f facebook every now and then um <laughs> it's uh, ralph ls I think it's Ralph Hyphen Ellis, I think. Um, 144, uh, 12 of the 12. Um, I'm sure people will be able to Google that. There is a uh, YouTube channel as well. I don't know how you would find that because sometimes if you type it in, it doesn't seem to come up. I seem to be on, what do they call it when they slow you down on YouTube and they don't promote you? Anyway, I yeah. seem to be throttled. Um, but true. anyway, somewhere on YouTube, you'll find my uh youtube channel if you find a uh a youtube video with like a, a a phoenix an eagle a red eagle on the front of it those are mine so click on one of those and you'll find them and then we've got the books there are 10 books in all we i think we've been through most of those books try them on amazon i think is probably the best because they have the latest uh editions try because there are lots of different sellers on Amazon, as you know, try to get the ones which are uh, 2017 or later, mm -hmm. and they will be the latest editions. Cool. There are still some early editions floating around, uh, but I would go to the uh, later editions. Okay. Uh, and you can pick those up as uh, iPad books, or you can pick them up as, uh, as paperbacks. So they do them as paperbacks. All right, Ralph, well, thanks for joining me, Matt. You've, you've blown my head off. I have listened to, obviously, a few of your uh, podcasts and whatever before. I've listened to Unslaved and whatever, but you always pick something else up, don't you? And uh... Yeah, it's, it's interesting because it's all explainable. So, yeah. um, you know, whatever part of this history you pick, there is an explanation for it mm. and a logical mm. one, you know, a secular, logical, historical uh, explanation for it which I find very interesting. So yeah, all of this is done from a historical viewpoint. You know, I'm a Gnostic atheist, so I, I don't have a, a dog in this fight. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't care what the Christians think or the Jews think or anyone else thinks. Um, I'm just doing it for the uh, historical uh, interest and research. So yeah, it's an interesting story. It is. Thanks for sharing your time with me, Ralph. We'll, uh, we'll arrange part two. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Okay. Cheers, Ralph. Bye-bye, mate. Bye.